What's up, guys? Eric here, Mr. Fired Up Well. Today, I'm excited to cover a stock that just went IPO, and the thing actually rallied to $58 a share. The high range of the IPO was $33. It rocketed to $58. It's come back, and now it's around the mid-40s range. So it's trading about $44 and change today. So the question you have is, first of all, what's the stock? You know from the title, it's Confluent. This is an interesting company, and it's one that's maybe overlooked because there's just been so many IPOs. I think we're just overwhelmed as investors, like not another one, not another one. But this one should probably be on your radar. It might be a little bit expensive here. If you're watching this, you're probably trying to figure out either A, what's this company all about? B, should I buy the stock now or should I wait? This video is going to provide you a detailed due diligence on the stock, give you an idea of what the company is all about. I'm also going to talk about the valuation and give you my opinion on the stock price. You're going to want to see this video. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, guys, so Confluent, we're going to go through some notes here. This is actually from the CEO, a little presentation, and I took some notes like I like to do, and I'm going to share those, go through it with you. I think this paints a really good picture of what they're all about. So if you think of, if you think of what Confluent's all about, you think of LinkedIn, if you know the history. So Apache Kafka was created about a decade ago, and seven years after spinning out of LinkedIn, so they were part of LinkedIn, and seven years ago, they spun out of LinkedIn. They just went public with an IPO, and you can buy shares. Now the stock price rallied up to... $68 a share, it has pulled back nicely. So if you're watching this video, you're thinking, I either wanna know more about what this company does, or you're thinking, where should I buy the stock? Cause it's made a nice pullback. So I'm gonna do two things in this video. I'm gonna give you some due diligence, give you a good understanding of what the company's all about. And then I'm gonna provide some opinions on the valuation. So let's get going. So it's a cloud native platform, according to the CEO in this, in this presentation that I watched online. It's an emerging category. They call it data in motion. And of course, they're gonna hype themselves up. So take some of this with a grain of salt, but it does give you a good idea of what they're all about. So data in, mo in motion, cloud native platform, emerging category. So the CEO is Jay Kreps, and he's actually a developer. He was part of the team that created Apache Kafka. Now that makes him really smart because obviously he's a developer and he helped develop the solution. So he understands it really well. That's a great strength. One of the weaknesses with that is the fact that, well, he's not really a salesperson, not that you have to be a salesperson to be a CEO, but generally speaking, the sales driven organizations within cloud do a lot better. And if you follow the channel, you've seen things like PagerDuty, where I like the stock. I've always said PagerDuty could even be a bigger powerhouse if they had more salespeople and a, just a more sales driven organization. So there's pros and cons to this. Um, with that said, they have done a good job of kind of penetrating the markets. And they've got so many large clients now that it's very simple for them to have case studies and to really kind of sell themselves through references, right? And through testimonials. So that is important to note. But he talks about everyday customer experiences that are being reimagined, not just front end customer interaction, but the steps to create and deliver services. Think of manufacturing, things like that. Software needs to work as a unified system. Transition isn't just a bolt on. He talks about requires fully integrated systems, smart real-time operations, and real-time data allows you to react with everything in the moment without any lag. Okay, so this is real time data. You can make decisions right now in the moment, not wait several days if the information siloed. So customers really, they don't tolerate stale data or experiences that aren't integrated and Confluent helps this happen, right? So that's what we're talking about here. So databases are an important part of the solution. He talks about how they're really important, but they're very limited. Individual databases create siloed and disconnected data, okay? So between applications, databases, and cloud systems, Confluent can connect all those and give you real-time data and analytics. Infrastructure for data in motion is what he calls it. Instead of passively storing data, Confluent allows real-time continuous data so businesses can react in the moment. I thought that was a powerful statement. Connect and access all data to protect and identify fraud in real-time, so it's really important you think of financials and banking, he talked a lot about identity fraud, things like that. So there's significant cost savings to these financial organizations that use Confluent. And the platform, this is the best way to put it, really acts as a central nervous system for all the data within an organization. It enables these powerful customer experiences that are really needed in today's business environment to win business and succeed. All right, guys, this is the S1 before the IPO. Again, they've, they've already gone public. They've already launched their IPO, but this gives you really good information and it's very relevant still because it just happened, right? So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to go through a few highlights here. So here's the S1. And I think this does a good job in this first part here of really 
you know, talking about their mission, which is to set data in motion. They talk about reimagining businesses for a digital first world by setting this data in motion. I'm going to give you some examples here of the industry sectors that they perform in and how they could benefit these sectors. So financial services, we talked about briefly, secure transactions anytime, anywhere, in any currency with real-time payments and instant fraud detection. Retail and e-commerce, modern omni-channel shopping, real-time inventory management and supply chain automation. So manufacturing, real-time logistics management, predictive maintenance, and throughput optimization. For media and entertainment, real-time content management, and personalized recommendations. A brief history, our history of setting data in motion. So we already know they went public. Let's go back in time. So Confluent was founded by Jay Krebs, who's now the CEO, as well as a couple others. Announced Conflu Confluent Platform 1.0 in 2015. General availability of Confluent Cloud was November 2017. In 2019, they had general availability of the Confluent server. You can see in 2019, in April 2019, they actually exceeded $100 million in ARR. That's annual recurring revenue. That's a pretty significant accomplishment a couple of years ago. September 2019, 50% of all customers on Confluent Cloud. So they've been rolling their customers, you know, from that previous on-prem model to their cloud model. In March of 2020, they exceeded a thousand customers. August 2020, available on three leading cloud providers. You can figure out which one those are. Reached over 120 pre-built connectors. Those are APIs so that they can essentially be plugged into other data sources. That was just here in 2021. And look how much they grew. So March 2021, they exceeded 2,500 customers. That's pretty significant growth. 2,500 customers in March 2021. And you look at this, just March of 2020, they exceeded 1,000 customers. So they literally grew from 1,000 customers to 2,500 customers in one year. Some quick numbers, I'm gonna take my camera off. So 51% was their last quarter year over year growth, 124% revenue growth of their clouds. They're growing that. Q1 remaining performance obligations, 281 million, 2,500 plus customers. 560 plus customers have $100,000 ARR. Now stay tuned, because I'm gonna go through some really detailed numbers and analytics on some of these numbers later on some slides. Customers with $1 million or more in annual recurring revenue is actually 60. So they have 60 pretty large customers. $50 billion total addressable market. I'll talk more about that later when I get to valuation. They did have this net loss. I'll talk more about the losses as well. Negative $45 million in Q1. Last quick piece here. This is from the S1 still. So I wanna talk about what their kind of mission statement is. So Confluent is on a mission to set data in motion. We have pioneered a new category of data infrastructure designed to connect all the applications, systems, and data layers of a company around a real-time central nervous system. I think that sentence alone gives you a good idea of what they're all about. This new data infrastructure software has emerged as one of the most strategic parts of the next generation technology stack. And using this stack to harness data in motion is critical to the success of modern companies as they strive to compete and win in the digital first world. All right, so just really fast here, we're gonna go through some slides, but check this out. So this diagram on the bottom right hand side, I think it does a really good job of explaining, especially if you're an IT nerd like I am, of kind of how everything flows together. So you can take a look at that, go ahead and feel free to pause your screen and look through it, but that gives you a good snapshot of how everything flows. All right, so it's cloud native, we already talked about this. I'm gonna go through, I'm not gonna read all this. There's really, what I wanna get out of this, there's three different ways that they can help organizations. So through cloud native, again, that was launched in late 2017. Okay, so then you've got complete, of course, a complete platform for data in motion, but this is important because it leverages capabilities from the open source Apache Kafka with significant proprietary capabilities. But Confluence technology essentially moves and processes data concurrently, uses specific tools, it has connectors. And then the third one is everywhere. Built a truly hybrid and multi-cloud offering. Confluent can support customers in their cloud and multi-cloud environments as well as on-premise or a combination of both. So they really can cover it all. You can see there's three different options. They can really do everything from a hybrid cloud to cloud, everything in between, they've got you covered. So let's look at some different data. Let's look first at some competitors. Then I'm gonna go through some stats and some numbers, valuation, things like that. So Confluent, they, they call out on their S S1, they actually say that their primary competitor is internal IT teams that can really use open source and make their own solution, right? But if they're not gonna do that, their other competition includes 
Azure Event Hubs, AWS, you can see them on your screen, Google Cloud. There's really a bunch of different products that compete. Legacy products have also pivoted in this space. So you've got Cloudera Dataflow, you've got Red Hat, which is part of IBM, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, there's a ton of them. Another one is Apache Pulsar, which is an open source alternative to Kafka. It's really gaining a lot of traction as well. So something to note, competition is pretty fierce in this space, but there is a pretty big total addressable market too, and we'll get to that later. Okay, let's look at some numbers here. So we got $272 million of implied ARR again, annual recurring revenue. That's up 55% year over year. So the last 12 months of revenue was 262.7 million. That was up 53% year over year. 88% of revenue was subscription-based as of last quarter. The non-GAAP total gross margin was 70% last quarter. Non-GAAP subscription margin was 78%, and non-GAAP services margin was 17%. So they do have a services part of their business as well. The LTM non-GAAP operating margin was negative 36%, but that's actually an improvement from negative 55% in the preceding period. They have negative 28% free cash flow margin last quarter, which is an improvement. Again, it was negative 64% the same quarter a year earlier. So year over year, 2,540 customers last quarter. So we saw in the S1, it was 2,500 plus. The number was 2,540. 107K a year is what the average is for customers when you think of their their revenue per customer. It's about $107,000 a year. So this is important here, guys. Cloud revenue, 13.9 million in Q1 2021. That was up 124% year over year, but it only represents about 20% of the subscription revenue. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you that it's an 80-20 model. That means 80% of their business right now is still on-prem or our hybrid type environments, and only 20% of their revenue, their subscription revenue, comes from the cloud. So they're trying to, to, to grow and change that, but you look at some of the other companies that are in the same situation, look at like a Splunk. That has not been perceived well from investors because they're kind of trying to switch from that on-prem to that cloud model. So it is something to pay attention to. Their net dollar retention is pretty decent. It's 117%, but that's actually down. It was 130% in the same quarter last year, which points to maybe a little bit more competition in the space. Their sales efficiency is mid-range when you look at other cloud companies and public SaaS businesses. So it's it's not great, but it's not bad. So they had $280 million in cash and cash equivalents last quarter. So Confluence burned through about $176 million to gain $272 million in applied ARR. That's a 1.5X ratio. That's actually a pretty good number. Kafka, one of the most successful open source projects ever. 70% of the Fortune 500 actually use it. So IoT, Internet of Things devices. This is just a general stat that I think is good for not just Confluent, but lots of other stocks within this sector. So IoT devices projected to generate data of approximately 73.1 zettabytes. If you don't know what a zettabyte is, look it up. That's a lot of information. By 2025, that's 4X, the 18.3 zettabytes generated in 2019. That's a big jump. Global public cloud services market expected to rise from $292 billion to $628 billion from 2020 to 2024. That's per IDC. That's a big jump. $292 billion to 620 billion from 2020 last year to 2024. The database market is estimated to be about $94 billion in annual spend. So I'm gonna cover real quick the four areas they really focus on. So you think of like Gartner kind of categorizes different tiers. So the application infrastructure and middleware, they also touch database management services, data integration tools and data quality tools, analytics and business intelligence. And if you add that together, the total addressable market, as you saw earlier, was about 50 billion or more, $50 billion plus. Now the anticipated compound annual growth rate is 22%, okay, through 2024. So if you do the math on that, that's $90 billion or more in 2024. Okay, so the IPO guys, they issued 23 million shares at $36 a piece. That was above the $29 to $33 price range. Of course, we see this time and time again. They give you a range and it ends up being on the high range. Then, you know, it ends up going even higher and then it opens to retail investors even higher than that. And you have to be really careful chasing these. You have to be careful of FOMO. So the price rose 25%, of course, on the first day of trading, which <laughs> surprisingly, it could have been even more. But listen to this. It was as high as $68 a share. That's way too much. The high range was $33 in the IPO. And generally speaking, for the most part, with an IPO like this, 
they're going to be pretty conservative and have the price pretty much baked in. So if you're paying, you know, $58 on something where they think it's the high range of 33, that's probably a bit of a stretch. You got to be careful at that price. So at $44 and 40 cents a share, the market cap is $11.2 billion. Now it's trading right now at $44 and 85 cents. It's down about a half percent today. So when I made this slide, it was $44 and 40 cents a share. So right now it's $11.31 billion market cap. So it has come down a lot from $58, but it's still pretty expensive. As you can see, the high range was 33 and it's trading at $44. So when you think of roughly an $11 billion market cap, you saw what the total addressable market is, but you're certainly paying a premium for that growth. If you look at the EV to sales ratio, it's around a 25X. It's a pretty hefty number. All right, guys. So you're wondering, you know, okay, Eric, that's great. Thanks for the information. You know, what should I do? Should I buy the stock? Of course, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't tell you what to buy or sell. I'll give you my opinion of what I think about the share price and you can do what's best for you and your money, your risk tolerance and so on. Now, before I get into my opinion on the price, if you could do me a favor, if you like this information, it was helpful. Definitely subscribe to the channel because this is what we do. We have new videos every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you like the video, drop me a like, it helps out the algorithm. Even better, drop me a comment, that really does help the algorithm. But please do subscribe, like, comment, and share, and I do appreciate the support. So, all right, so what do I think about the stock? I think a couple things. There's some risk, of course. I think when you think of the risk, you think of competition. I think if you talk to developers, though, they'll tell you that these guys are really good at what they do. And although there's a lot of other competition, these guys kind of are best of breed. So. Can that be disrupted with time as technology you know, gets more disruptive and competes more? I think that's certainly a risk to consider as an investor. The other thing, of course, is the valuation. Now, you saw some of the metrics in the previous slides. You know, The high end of the IPO is, was $33. The thing's trading right now. And the ticker, again, on this, guys, is CFLT. So Confluent is CFLT. It trades in the NASDAQ. But it's trading right now at $44.88. It pulled back the low, the 52-week low is $40.50, and the 52-week high is $57.99. I like this stock. As always, I would dollar cost average. I think it's probably a little bit expensive here. Ideally, I'd love to see it come below $40. It might not happen, though. So if you get a taper tantrum or something where we get a sell-off and a lot of the growth names get hit. Now, it is deceiving because, of course, you know when it opened, it actually opened higher. So... If you look at a chart, the real low was on July 2nd. That's Friday, July 2nd at $43.50. I considered nibbling there knowing it was too expensive and I have to dollar cost down. For me, with socks like this, it's a compelling growth story. I think it's worth an addition to my portfolio, maybe 1%, but I don't want to, you know, to reach and it's not compelling enough where I'm going to chase it. So if this thing can come to me and I can get it maybe close to $40 or under $40, I might nibble dollar cost average because it could certainly go back. The problem, you look at some of these, you look at Unity, the thing rallied up to I think $170 a share and it came back all the way to $85. Now they have earnings coming up here, according to this, August 5th. So that's not that far away, just a couple of weeks away. So I think for me, I'm going to wait and see how the earnings go and just be patient, be disciplined on this stock. A couple other things I want to point out. So one of the risks I mentioned earlier is that they're about 20% of their subscription revenue right now is cloud-based. That means they're an 80-20 blend. So they're still in that on-prem. And that is a risk to me because you think of like Splunk, you know, a lot of times the market doesn't perceive that well. Although outside of the whole COVID thing, it's going to get better for companies like Splunk and like Alteryx. So it's probably okay, but it's something to at least keep in mind as an investor. I also wanted to mention a couple of their customers. They work with a lot of big customers, a lot of small customers. They work with a lot of people, but... So some of the Fired Up Wealth favorites, you know, they work with Datadog, they work with Airbnb, they work with Cloudflare, they work with Shopify. So, and they've got plugins and partnerships with a lot of these different companies. So they're a big deal. So for me, actually, growth is a concern just because their growth was good, but they're not going to be in hyper growth because they already have so many customers. So that's another potential risk. But that's my analysis on it, guys. Again, I would, I would love to see it under $40. I like it. It's not compelling enough where I'm going to chase it. I think there's a lot of positive things, a bullish case you can make. I think there are some risks where you can make a potential bearish case, especially at this valuation. So definitely be careful, do what's best for your portfolio. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, hit like, drop a comment. Appreciate your time and attention. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.